Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Rose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Shana Hamilton, master's student at the University of Regina, will be speaking about Europe's most invasive fish in Saskatchewan, understanding Prussian carp distribution and resource use. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation, either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. We have a great lineup of speakers scheduled. Join us on January 28th for a presentation by Dr. Shelley Proust, species conservation ecologist with Parks Canada and adjunct professor at the University of Alberta to learn about Mormon metal marks, a butterfly that's at risk in Saskatchewan. And if you don't wanna miss our February 10th webinar, webinar by Laurel Berkeley with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, as she'll be speaking about greater sage grouse in Montana. You can register for these webinars through the PCAP website, and all past presentations can be found on the PCAP YouTube channel. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded there in the near future. I would also like to mention that PCAP is hosting the 8th Native Prairie Restoration Reclamation Workshop from February 1st to 5th. This year, the workshop will be entirely online and the early bird registration deadline is Friday, January 15th, so that's tomorrow. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Eco-Friendly Sask, Pembina Pipelines, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, Sask Energy, SaskTel, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our supporting sponsors are Camp Wolf Willow and Rancher Stewardship Alliance Inc, as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation. If you are on the cell phone app, you can send your questions by chat to the organizer and questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Now a bit about today's presenter. Shana Hamilton is a current master's student at the University of Regina under the supervision of Dr. Christopher Summers. She completed her undergraduate degree at Regina and is interested in human conflict with fish and wildlife and commuting research back to, back to citizens. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Shana. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna get this up in presentation mode. All right. So thank you very much for having me, Caitlin. Um, I'm here today to talk to you guys about Prussian carp, um, which is one of Europe's most invasive fish species in Saskatchewan. Um, so as Caitlin said, I am a master's student at the University of Regina under the supervision of Dr. Chris Summers, and I'm also a MITAX Accelerate Internship with the Saskatchewan Wildlife Federation. So just a little bit of an outline for today's presentation. I'm gonna give you guys a brief introduction of invasive species. It's becoming more and more popular in recent years. So I'm sure most of you guys are probably familiar with the concept. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about Prussian carp themselves, um, some of their biology and their traits. And then I'm going to give you an overview of my research project, which included what my research objectives are, um, how I gathered the data, and then what results we found from my research. So invasive species by definition are any non-native species that cause economic or ecological harm and oftentimes they cause both. They are invasive species across the world and across many different taxa including mammals, plants, fish and other wildlife. Aquatic invasive species in particular are extremely widespread and also extremely damaging to biodiversity. This is in part because aquatic ecosystems are very hard to have proper removal techniques. Um, essentially, unless you're willing to dam off and drain an entire water body, it's pretty much almost impossible to remove them completely unless you catch them at the very, very beginning of their introduction, which often doesn't happen. And some aquatic invasive species in North America you might already be familiar with are zebra and quagga mussels, as well as sea lamprey, which are very invasive throughout the Great Lakes. 
also florida um if you guys don't know florida is sort of like the disneyland for invasive species um they have so so many invasives and are kind of the the model for for how bad things can actually get for reference there are 55 freshwater invasive species fish species in florida alone and that's not including saltwater species or any of the mammals and reptiles or birds that are also invasive there so as far as invasive carp go um, prussian carp are not the first invasive carp in north america um, the group of carp that are commonly referred to as asian carp are big head carp silver carp black carp and grass carp um, however all of the invasive carp species are originally native to the Asia area. And so this is a term that has kind of been assigned to the four species, but isn't really representative of all species. Um, common carp are also very invasive throughout North America and especially here in Saskatchewan. Um, goldfish is another Asian carp that can be invasive and is quite a bit through Alberta and I believe Ontario as well. And then most recently we have Prussian carp. So what are Prussian carp? Um, they are in the Carassius genus, which is the same genus as goldfish, um, and they are small carp. So they do not get much bigger than about 50 centimeters or 500 millimeters. They don't get much bigger than around the three to four pound mark. Um, but one of the things is they are very cryptic with goldfish in the fact that all of their external features um, overlap in some manner. So any way we use to identify a fish externally um, you can't differentiate between a goldfish and a Prussian carp. So we have to use DNA-based approaches to identify species. Um, these fish are native to Eastern Europe and Asia. Um, also, here's an example. Um, so these are all silver fish on a screen, aside from the orange ones. Um, and so just by looking at them, some of these might look like the Prussian carp I've pictured on the last slide but all the fish on this slide are actually goldfish. None of these are Prussian carp. Um, so this just exemplifies how cryptic they can be. So for life history, there's some certain traits that Prussian carp have that make them better at being invasive than some other species. Um, so one of these is that they spawn multiple times a year. Um, so they have been recorded to spawn up to three to four times a year with the average adult female uh, laying about 200 to 250,000 eggs. So that is a huge reproductive output. But not only do they just spawn a lot, they also have different reproductive methods. And so I have stars here to represent sets of chromosomes or essentially genetic material. Um, so with normal fish reproduction, the female fish and the male fish each contribute one half of their genetic pairing to make a diploid offspring or an offspring that has two sets of chromosomes. Um, we are diploid as humans, but Prussian carp have a unique reproductive strategy, primarily when they're first establishing an invasive range, and that is called gynogenesis. And this process is still really not quite fully understood. There's a lot of research that needs to happen into the mechanics of exactly how it is possible. But what we do know is that with gynogenesis, there is a triploid female fish that uses donor sperm to create a triploid offspring that is a genetic clone of themselves. And to sum that up, Prussian carp are able to steal other fish's sperm to reproduce their own genetic offspring. Um, the other kicker is that so far this donor sperm only needs to be related on the family level. And right now that includes every minnow, carp, and sucker species um, that is out there. So there's a lot more testing that needs to be done to know which North American species are donors, but they have a very wide range of reproductive capability that essentially allows them to be the only individual fish in a water body and still increase their population. So you can very easily see why these fish can be so damaging and so invasive. So a little bit more, they are considered omnivores. They've been known to eat algae, detritus, zooplankton, invertebrates, and macrophytes. Um, that gives them a lot of different prey that they can live and survive off of, which means they can do very well in a variety of different water bodies. 
They also have an extremely high tolerance to dissolved oxygen. Um, and in, it is thought that Prussian carp can survive periods of low to no oxygen for around three to four months, which essentially is enough to let them get through a winter that would otherwise kill other fish. They can also tolerate wide ranges of salinity and chemical toxins, um, more so than our native species. And finally, the uh, US Fish and Wildlife did a assessment on their invasive potential in, in the United States. And they defined Prussian carp habitat as any lake, river, reservoir, or creek. So essentially, if there is water, Prussian carp could inhabit it. So obviously we know that invasive species have an impact. And what are some of the impacts of Prussian carp? Um, so they are considered one of the most invasive fish species in Europe, and that title does not come lightly. And in Europe, we know that they have extremely rapid colonization. Um, one study in Greece found that the first year of sampling, there was one individual Prussian carp sampled. And by the 10th year after, Prussian carp accounted for 95% of the fish biomass in that lake, which is an absolutely extremely high number. And they essentially take over the watersheds that they're introduced to. This also results in a decline in the native population of fish. And most often it's other suckers and native carp that see the impact most. Um, they compete for resources with other species, so anything that also feeds on any of the zooplankton or the invertebrates now have to compete with all of the Prussian carp present. And then there is a slight uh, reproduction competition component where if you're stealing a native species sperm to reproduce yourself, um, that sperm is not available to reproduce with the other native species. So there is a little bit of competition there, but it's much less important compared to just the complete number and, and takeover of habitat. So how did Prussian carp get to North America in the first place? Um, so they were introduced in 2006 in Alberta, and we're still not entirely sure what the pathway was, um, but it was believed to be through some sort of live fish um, pathway, which could be a fish food market or through the pet trade, potentially misidentified as goldfish because it's very easy to do so. And one study found that there is a five year doubling time in their range. So essentially every five years um, for the 10 years after their in introduction, they were doubling the area of um, land that they had invaded. And so in Saskatchewan, there is a single report in 2006 of a Prussian carp on the Gold Star, which is just north of Swift Current. Um, and that is in the South Saskatchewan River system. It was actually in a creek that is a tributary of that system. Um, but it wasn't until spring of 2018 when an extremely large number of both adults and juveniles were discovered in Stockwell Lake, which is the blue pin. Um, Stockwell Lake is a tributary of Lake Diefenbaker and the South Saskatchewan River system, um, but it's not connected year round. It actually dries up for most of the year, except for in high water. And this was very, very shocking because not only was it the first indication that we had an established population of Prussian carp in the province, but you can also see how far inland from Alberta they had to have gotten to get to Stockwell Lake. Um, and we, do, we did believe that they had come through Lake Diefenbaker and flooded into Stockwell. So they would have had to already make it almost halfway through the province east to west um, before they were really discovered in any number. And so what do we know about Prussian carp in North America? Everything except for their introduction um, is all known from studies that have been done throughout their invasive Europe range. And unfortunately, aside from three studies out of Alberta, we know almost nothing about how they behave and interact in our North American ecosystems. And so that's where my project came in. And so I had two really simple research objectives. Um, we wanted to conduct the first surveys for Prussian carp in Saskatchewan. And then additionally, because we knew there was an established population in Stockwell Lake, we wanted to um, look at their resource use. Essentially, how are they eating other prey items to survive and continue to reproduce? So for our surveys, we wanted to test a lot of the 
um, known location as well as extending past the location at the time of the start of the study. So this included many sites throughout the South Saskatchewan River system and their tributaries, and then also sites past their known distribution. So we wanted to test up by Saskatoon. We also had the opportunity to work with the provincial fisheries biologists on their assessment at Cotto Lake, which is the very top pin at the top of this this map. So we are also able to do some sampling well outside what would be their, their current known range. Um, and so the star for Regina is just for reference. So how are we going to do these surveys? Um, we wanted to prioritize using live trapping methods because we weren't sure if we were going to find Prussian carp in all of our locations and we wanted to minimize the, any impacts on native species. So we chose to use spike nets which are a um, passive form of sampling. So we'd set the nets out and we'd leave them for an overnight period and then come back in the morning and check them. When we checked them, we would release any native species and then uh, humanely euthanize any Prussian carp. And so these nets were really good at catching adult fish, but we wanted to be able to sample for juveniles as well and do some more active sampling. And so we used beach seines to do that, um, where we would pull the beach sain through shallow water um, to see what fish were there at that very time. And we standardized the effort across all of our sites so that we could compare um, abundance. And also we found out that make sure you have proper um, PPE when you're sampling because sandals do not work very well for beach staining. I found that, found that out the hard way. So once we actually had fish either through our seine or in our nets, um, we identified the fish using external features when possible. Uh, we recorded um, which species were caught and how many, and then any native species were released. If we did get Prussian carp, they were humanely euthanized, and then we collect a, collected a variety of metrics to start understanding some of their very basic biology. So we'd look at their size in both length and mass. We would sex them if possible, also look at the maturity of the fish. We took DNA samples so that we could verify that it was indeed Prussian carp we were working with. And we also collected some aging samples as well to try and get an idea of age structure as well as age classes. In addition to our own sampling efforts, we partnered with the Saskatchewan Wildlife Federation to set up a citizen science program. Um, so report invasive carp at swf.sk.ca was a way for us to put the call out to anglers and other water buddy users across the province of Saskatchewan, where they could submit a photo with a GPS location if they believe that they found a Prussian carp. And this was really important because we can only be so many places at one time and we have a very limited sampling summer. So if we're able to tap into the effort of the hundreds of thousands of anglers across the province, um, that's effort that we can never replicate. And so we hoped that they would be able to help inform our surveys and increase our database. And so in terms of the results of our sampling effort, we did have 24 different species that we sampled um, and we did actually find a Prussian carp in our survey sampling. So here's just a variety of some of the species that we came across. Um, for the citizen science project, we had 40 reports over the span of the project, and of those, 18 were confirmed as Carassius. Um, I'm not specifying between goldfish and Prussian carp here because we didn't technically have DNA samples. However, in Saskatchewan, we don't have any existing um, populations of goldfish that are outside of closed systems, and so we only had two reports that we believed were goldfish because they both came from urban retention ponds. And all of the other reports did come from open systems where there was no known population of goldfish. So we interpreted these to be Prussian carp. And also we got a lot of reports that weren't Prussian carp that were common carp, suckers and other silverfish species. Um, the picture on the bottom left is all of the common carp that winter kill in Wascana Lake every year. Um, so that was our most popular other species that was reported. So in terms of a map of the efforts of our surveys, the blue pins indicate reports that were considered to be Prussian carp from citizen science, and the orange pins are from our own field sampling. 
So we found Prussian carp throughout the entire South Saskatchewan River system from the Alberta border just past Saskatoon. Um, and this included some of the tributaries. So here is a kind of better picture of the current watersheds um, or water pathways that are have a known presence of Prussian carp. But the thing is, is that when we look at the areas that are not inhabited, that we didn't, well, not necessarily uninhabited, they potentially could be uninhabited. We simply did not detect them in our sampling efforts. You'll notice on the yellow side, there currently isn't a barrier that's preventing Prussian carp from being any further past where we found them in Saskatoon. And in fact, it connects to both the rest of the South Saskatchewan River up until uh, you get to Tobin Lake. And it also connects back to the North Saskatchewan River, which flows back into Alberta. So currently there's nothing stopping them from being in that system or continuing to spread through that system. We just simply did not detect them in our surveys. Additionally, Lake Diefenbaker has two dams. The North End is a hydroelectric dam with a spillway. And we already know that Prussian carp have made it past that dam. But on the other end is the Coppell Dam, which separates the South Saskatchewan River from the Coppell watershed. And currently we do believe that that dam is a barrier to Prussian carp movement. We did not detect Prussian carp in either citizen science reports or our own sampling in the Quipel system. Um, but however, if that barrier were ever to no longer work as an effective control measure, that would open up Prussian carp to the entire Quipel system continuing on through Manitoba and eventually into the Red River. And that system is much more akin to the types of water bodies that they're extremely invasive in in Europe. And I believe that their impact would probably be more devastating in that system than it currently is in the Saskatchewan River. And so now to switch over to resource use, one of the important things we wanted to know was how are these fish surviving? What are they eating? Who might they be competing with? And so, as I said, we chose Stockwell Lake. Here's a little bit more of a zoomed in picture. So we have Lake Diefenbaker on the bottom right with the South Saskatchewan River running north towards Saskatoon. Um, and then there's Stockwell is part of the Annerley Lakes chain, which has a series of very small lakes. Um, they're not, they, the lakes themselves are connected by culverts, um, but they're not connected back to Lake Diefenbaker except for in high water events. And so we use stable isotope ecology to look at resource use. And if you're not familiar with isotopes, the theory behind it is essentially you are what you eat. And so I've used colors here, and my apologies if anybody is colorblind, hopefully you can see at least one of these. But um, if you're looking at a fish, which are represented by the ovals, a fish that eats both plants and invertebrates will be a mixture of their two isotopic signatures. So essentially, if plants are red and invertebrates are blue, that fish's value will be purple or a mix of the two. And the same is to be said for the yellow, blue, making a green fish. Um, so we essentially take samples of the entire environment, both prey items and the fish that we're interested in, and then we reconstruct backwards to figure out what proportions of prey make up the isotopic signature of the fish. And so first we needed to collect all of our samples. And so we went out and we used gill netting and beach staining to collect both adult and juvenile fish in Stockwell Lake. And then to collect our baseline samples, we did a variety of methods, including sifting through sediment, collecting macrophytes, filtering water for algae, zooplankton hulls, um, and much, much more. So to prepare your samples for isotopic analysis, you want to take your samples that you've collected, in this case fish, and we put them in a drying oven at 55 degrees for 24 to 48 hours. When they're done with that process, they come out pretty crispy and looking a little bit like fish sticks, um, but we grind those dried fish tissues up really, really finely into a powder. And then we pack them into a tin cup and they get sent to the IEC S lab, which is at the University of Regina, and they run the samples and the mass spec for us, and then we get the data back. Um, we did choose to look at both carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur isotopes, which are just three different isotopes that you can look at. And 
typical studies look at carbon and nitrogen, but we wanted to add, its, add sulfur in for just improved resolution because it makes it that much more clear which prey items are actually contributing to their diet. Um, so to analyze the data, we used R. Um, I'm not going to touch very much on this because it can get pretty complicated, but essentially we used a mixing model analysis approach to reconstruct the isotopic composition of the fish. And so in terms of results, we sent a total of 359 samples to the lab to be run. Um, and so we had a variety of different prey items, which are listed in the table, as well as the number of samples for each, but we sent 212 fish to be analyzed. And so when we're looking at Prussian carp overall, um, this is a figure of the diet proportion by prey type for Prussian carp. So what we see here is that about 50% of the diet is considered to be contributed to by coronamids or um, little red invertebrates that are found in the sediment. 30% is considered to be from zooplankton and then a much smaller percent of the other prey items that we sampled. So primarily they're eating zooplankton, which are free flowing in the water and very small invertebrates. Additionally, we collected a size range of fish from Stockwell Lake, Prussian carp specifically, and so we wanted to know, um, is there any differences in their diet over their various life stages? So we essentially sorted them into size categories um, that were somewhat representative of different life stages. So we had very, very large fish um, that would be fully grown adults. We had smaller fish that were um, reproductively mature, um, but just not quite as, as big as the other ones. Then we had juveniles, and finally we also did collect very small fry from that year's hatch. And so when we ran those through the isotopic um, process, this is what we got out. And there's a lot of different boxes here, so I'm going to sum up the trends for you. Essentially, um, smaller fish have a much higher proportion of zooplankton in their diet than larger fish do. And also we see that as size increases, the amount of coronamids in the diet also increases. So there's a shift between more of a filter feeding for zooplankton in smaller fish to a more sediment based or larger invertebrate prey for larger adults. Um, and this is what we expected to see. I do just want to say really quickly, if anybody has a weak stomach, there is going to be some fish guts in the next picture. So maybe just avert your eyes really quickly. Um, so we also had some unexpected findings in this research. And one of those findings was we discovered reproductively mature males in Stockwell Lake. And so that brought up the question of if Prussian carp have the ability to reproduce without males, why are there males present in the first place? And also, are they actually reproducing using gynogenesis or maybe they are reproducing normally as we expected them to? Um, this is something that I don't have the answer for, but we do have a new grad student who is just starting her program and she is going to be looking into this for her project. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll have an answer to this question. And so finally, just to summarize everything up from today, um, Prussian carp are expanding in the South Saskatchewan River and they do have the potential to spread to the North Saskatchewan River as well. And Capel Dam right now is a great barrier for the Quapel system. Um, and I hope that we can keep that intact and that that holds out to be true. Fish always kind of tend to find a way, but I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed on that one. And then also Prussian carp diet in Stockwell Lake is primarily from small invertebrates and zooplankton. And there is a shift in diet from pelagic or water column based feeding in smaller fish to benthic feeding in adults. And so with that, Prussian carp are an already established aquatic invasive species in Saskatchewan. And they definitely do need more research to figure out what exactly their impacts are going to be. Um, and prevention of spread to the Quapel should be a key priority going forward. So with that, I would like to acknowledge my partners, um, obviously the University of Regina and Dr. Chris Summers, the Saskatchewan Wildlife Federation, and also the SAS Ministry of Environment for all of their help on this project. I'd also like to thank my funding, um, NSERC, the Fish and Wildlife Development Fund, MyTax and innovation.ca, uh, the Canadian Foundation for 
innovation. Um, without the Saskatchewan Wildlife Federation and all of their outreach and their support and the citizen science program, this project could not have been what it was. So I just really wanna emphasize that. And then to my field assistants, my lab and Dr. Bjorn Wassel at the IECS. And with that, I can take any questions. Uh, first off, thank you so much, Shana, for the fascinating presentation. Um, it was really clear and informative and really easy to follow. And um, I think your take home messages were really, really powerful. So thank you. Uh, we do have a couple questions coming in from listeners. Uh, first off, a listener named Aaron would like to know if uh, they are able to tolerate lower wa water quality. So I would say probably yes, because with the uh, dissolved oxygen and their very, very wide range of temperature and salinity um, and their kind of higher tolerance to chemicals, they definitely do seem to be able to survive in habitats that are less ideal for our native species. Um, one key example of this is in Alberta, they are able to establish an irrigation canals. And there are other species that can establish there as well, but most species um, don't tend to, to live in that type of water. So um, algae filled water, shallow water, warm water are all just the top of the line habitats for Prussian carp to survive in. Um, thanks for that answer. The the same listener would like to know, what are the implications for bioaccumulation of heavy metals? Do you know anything about that? That is a really great question. Um, I would say that's outside of my area of expertise, um, but I can easily see how if there is a metal contaminant in the prey source, how they would you would be able to look at accumulation. I don't know if that's been done, but that's a very interesting question. Thanks for that answer. That is an interesting question, isn't it? <laughs> um, a listener named Grant would like to know, are Prussian carp edible like the common carp? Is there a potential use of the fish for other food sources? That is an excellent question. And so I can confirm that they are indeed edible. Um, I did eat one myself just so that I could provide an answer to this question. Um, they actually have a very nice white flesh that's very firm, um, somewhat similar to the texture of a yellow perch. Um, the only kind of caveat there is that they are still a very bony fish. There's lots of bones. So if that's something that you don't particularly like in fish meat, um, it might not be the fish for you to eat, uh, but they definitely are edible. Huh, well, good for you for trying one. <laughs> I'd be game to try one too. <laughs> um, a listener named Jessica uh, would like to know what would the main issues in competition with native species, food sources, or do they eat native fish fry as well? I'm sorry, you cut out there. I'm not sure if I heard the rest of that question. Oh, sorry. Do they eat native fish fry? Like, what are the main issues with competition with native species? Uh, can you hear me okay? Hi, Shana, can you hear me okay? Okay, I think Shane has lost audio here. Um, I've had a couple people type in that they can hear me, so I will just send her a message and see if we can get her back on the line. Hello? Hi, I think we Sorry, lost you I, there for a second. I disconnected, <laughs> yeah. Um, so you were just telling me Jessica's question. Uh, yes, so what is the issue with competition um, with native species? Is it that they're eating native fish fry or is there something else going on? 
So the, the answer to that is, is primarily two different methods. Um, the first is that they're simply taking over in numbers. Um, that reproductive output is so high that just they're able to increase their population so much faster than native species. And then I would say secondarily, the competition for the similar prey items is also driving that, that factor. Thanks for that answer. Um, a listener named Trevor would like to know if you think the presence of aggressive predators uh, like pike and walleye would have an impact on controlling Prussian carp. I think that's a really excellent question and something that definitely could be looked into in the future because we don't currently know if our large pike and walleye will even um, consume them as a prey item. I think definitely the smaller ones, they probably would opportunistically. In terms of a population control, that may help, especially for like with established populations, but I don't think it is enough to um, control their entire population just because they can just they can make so many of themselves in a single year. I don't know if predatory competition would be enough to control their population size. Mm, interesting. Thanks for that answer. Um, I guess in, in that sort of lines, a listener named Matthew would like to know what can be learned and transferred from the efforts to control other aquatic invasive species to the response to the presence of Prussian carp in the Canadian prairies. Do you have any comments about that? That is an excellent question. Um, so there is lots of research done in other places of the world to look at how to control invasive carp across species. Um, so some of the removal efforts include um, incentivizing an industry around um, harvesting carp. There's also um, using acoustic tracking to locate aggregations, especially in wintertime for common carp and doing a targeted removal effort there. Um, and mostly what kind of it all comes down to is removing enough to kind of keep the population from expanding. Um, so what exactly will work for Prussian carp? I'm not sure yet because that research still needs to be done, but I think there's definitely some options that we can, you know, start trying from other carp removal efforts and seeing which ones are going to be most effective for Prussian carp. Um, we do know that they can be electrofished. They're pretty strong, so it, it can be slightly difficult to do, but that's definitely one method. And then controlling the ability to spread wherever possible is going to be very crucial. Sounds like a lot of work. Um, there's a few listeners that are interested in um, the possibility of Prussian carp as pet food. Is that something that's being considered as, as part of their eradication? So I think anytime that you can find a use for a fish that needs to be removed in large quantities is excellent. Um, I don't know their nutrition base and how suitable they would be in a type of pet food. With a lot of bones, I don't know if they'd be very great for dogs or not. I'm not a veterinarian though. Um, cat food, it would probably, I would think, make a decent um, contribution to, to cat food. Um, so I think that's definitely something that can be explored. Um, common carp in Australia are actually used as cement filler. Oh, that's interesting. That's a really unique use. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought about that. <laughs> Um, there's a couple questions about climatic conditions. Uh, what is their temperature range and can this restrict um, their range going north? And do you know under which climatic conditions will carp um, have winter kill? That is a very excellent question. Um, so in terms of their tolerable range, um, they do live in Siberia, <laughs> which is a <laughs> condition that's quite similar to to our own. Um, I don't think at this time they would be restricted by northern geographical movement. It's just a connection of connectivity of water. And then the winter quill question is actually something we have wondered ourselves, kind of what is that final cutoff point of when will they winter kill? I don't have the answer, but that's something that definitely um, can be looked into in the future and probably should just to determine their, their environmental tolerance. Yes, interesting. Um, a listener named Renata would like to know, did the sulfur isotope provided the resolution you were expecting as it better distinguishes areas with different salinities? 
So the resolution um, did work very, very well. Um, I did run the model with only carbon and nitrogen just because I was curious to see um, how much of a difference it made. And essentially, the sulfur isotope allowed us to distinguish between gamerous and coronamids. Um, so without the sulfur isotope, we would not have been able to identify which of those prey items was the contributing factor. It simply would have been one or the other, but we wouldn't have known which one. Thanks for that answer. Uh, there's a couple questions that are, um, I, people are interested in the dam and uh, the dam at Diefenbaker as a barrier to spread into Kapow. Um, do you think that there should be more efforts taken to to make sure that the Prussian carp don't breach the dam? Do you think there's enough effort going on right now? What are your thoughts about that? So that's a really excellent question. Um, I am not in charge of the management by any means. Um, I may have my own opinions of it. I think that the needed parties are aware of the importance of the dam. Um, I do work with um, communicating with the different stakeholders um, and different applicable agencies. And I, I believe that they are aware of the, the importance of the dam. And so I think at this point, um, it's just going to be, they're going to have to figure out how best to, to manage that. Um, and I'm very confident that they will. Thanks for, for that answer. Um, do you know of any future plans to use eDNA to detect this species? So that's a really good question. Um, eDNA is a technique that can be added to any toolbox, um, but any technique has limitations. And I think it's really important to remember that when it comes to invasive species. Um, for those who aren't aware, eDNA is a technique where you take water samples and look for free floating remnants DNA pieces and try to link them up with their uh, the species they came from. And so it's often used as a monitoring or detection tool. Um, and so essentially you could take a water sample and figure out if a Prussian carp DNA is in the water. Um, there's a lot of questions around that. I'm by no means an expert either. Um, I think if you wanted to use it as a way to search outside of the known distribution, I think that's a perfectly reasonable application of it. Um, I just I would just stress that we don't have a primer, uh, as far as I'm aware, that is specific to Prussian carp and doesn't have um, any competition with kind of some other species. There's also always false positives. Um, and so it has to be paired with some sort of um, truthing technique, whether that be gill nets or electrofishing to confirm the positive D eDNA hit. So I, I don't, I'm not discrediting it by any means. I think it's a tool that when in the right situation can be very effective. Um, I don't know if I would rely on it entirely. Thanks for that answer. Um, a listener named Erin would like to know if Prussian carp have been found in beaver ponds, and if so, what were the impacts? That's a very good question. So in terms of Saskatchewan, I don't believe they have. They've all been in either the South Saskatchewan River or its connected tributaries. Um, I think the bigger question there would be in terms of how they how they would get into one to begin with. Um, so I don't have an answer to that question because none of our sites were, were a beaver pond, but that's definitely, if they ever got in, that would be a, a cool study to do. Yes, yeah, it would. Um, a listener named Lynn would like to know, or she comments, I know that they have a higher CU tolerance, but do they perform well in peat bog and swampland pH levels? Um, being that they're from Siberia and perhaps in different water bodies. Do you know anything about that? I don't know a lot about their pH tolerance. Um, I do know that there is a pretty saline area. I believe it's like an ocean freshwater mixing area. And there is a population of Prussian carp there. I don't know if they have been there extensively and are maybe more adapted to that pH level. Um, as far as I know, they're just extremely general. Um, I don't unfortunately have a range number for you off the top of my head. Um, so it, it would kind of depend on if that pH range is in their tolerable range and if there's enough water for them to swim in, which quite honestly only has to be like a foot of water, I would say it's definitely possible. 
Okay, they're pretty ambitious. <laughs> um, one of our listeners is wondering about your thoughts regarding the best control or management tools that can be used to prevent this, the further spread of Prussian car. That's a really great question. Um, obviously, education and awareness is a huge part of invasive species management. Um, there's a variety of different pillars that control is is measured around and education is, is one of them. Um, and then just identifying existing barriers and maintaining them as a barrier is also important. In terms of any control measures that can be used to minimize or reduce populations, I'm really not sure which is going to be the best at this point because we don't have any research on, on which techniques may be most effective for Prussian carp in North America. So that's definitely something that I'm hoping we can figure out over, over the next few years. So will your project run into a PhD then? <laughs> Mine won't, no. I'm I'm leaving it at the master's level, but it's definitely a question that many groups are well aware of, um, and I'm sure it'll be investigated very soon. Thanks for that answer. Um, a couple of listeners are typing in about how excellent of uh, a presentation and how timely it is. Um, one listener is wondering if you would be open to receiving email, um, and if there's an email address that you could provide for future contact. Oh, well, thank you very much for all the people who are who are writing that. I very much appreciate it. Um, yes, absolutely. You can send me an email. Um, my email address is shanahamilton4 at gmail.com. So that's S-H-A-Y-N-A, -A, Hamilton spelled like the appliance in the city, and the number four at gmail.com. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions that we have for today. Um, again, there's a few more excellent presentation uh, comments coming in. So I guess with that, we'll leave it there. So thank you so much, Shana, for your time. I know you're really busy with your thesis and all of your other uh, public speaking engagements. So thanks for taking the time for our speaker series. And well, to all of our listeners out there. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. <laughs> to all of our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Please be sure to check out the PCAP website for other upcoming webinars. And with that, have a great rest of your day, everyone.